Good morning, and welcome to the second day of our deliberation on everyday religion and sustainable environments in the Himalaya. Uh, I want to welcome back people who attended the conversation yesterday, and welcome to any new uh, colleagues and friends who are coming just for today's session. And I also want to uh, welcome all those people who are following our conversation on the, uh, uh, via internet. Uh, yesterday, uh, there were over 500 hits. Uh, that means people looked at our program at different points, and uh, over 30 or so people followed it uh, pretty much you know, as if they were sitting in the room. So I want to thank uh, all uh, the people who are uh, participating in this conference via internet as well. Well, uh, today, uh, today's session uh, is again, you know, uh, uh, a session that invites scholars who have been working in the region for quite some time, and they will uh, share their work to help us better grapple with the uh, questions that we have been uh, dealing with uh, as to uh, why and what you know can be learned by looking at relationships, interactions, and intersections between everyday religion, sustainability, uh, and sustainable environments, uh, and also in the context of Himalaya. Today, uh, I'm really uh, honored, and, uh, and I'm thankful to uh, Professor Kamaljit Bawa, uh, who has agreed to chair this uh, session. Uh, he uh, is uh, well known to anyone who works in that part of the world. Uh, he's just, br just briefly, he's an ev evolutionary ecologist, conservation biologist, and he's a distinguished professor of biology at University of Massachusetts, Boston. But many of us who work in that part of the world, we know uh, all him all because of his you know, incredible uh, uh, commitment to uh, questions related to sustainable development. And one organization that, you know, especially younger you know, uh, colleagues here, students, uh, that they should really get to know is the uh, you know, uh, uh, organization that he established called Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology. A3, and in fact, one of the A3 person will be also sharing uh, his work, Sam, uh, Samuel Thomas. So, so this is one organization that really, uh, in my judgment, you know, does uh, not just outstanding, but really inspiring work. Uh, uh, so I, I would uh, en uh, encourage people to uh, uh, look at their website, uh, and if you are in the region, go and talk to uh, some of their uh, you know, staff and people who are associated with the program. And again, uh, just to remind, Professor Bawa just came out with a book, Himalaya Mountains of Life. There are a couple of copies left. Uh, all the uh, proceeds go to A3. Uh, it's $50. Uh, people can write a check or you know cash. And if you don't have your checkbook, you can just simply take the book and you know uh, leave your address and send the check later on to the uh, address that we will. You know my colleagues will give it to you. On that note, I would like to now turn the floor to. Professor Bauer. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Ashok, for wonderful introduction uh, about me and uh, very generous words about me, and more importantly, very generous words about A tree. And I do urge you to look at our website, www.atree.org, and to continue with this personal plug. Also, the Himalaya book has a website, www.himalayabook.com, and visit that book's website, too. I think my job here is to keep the time. Ashok has already introduced you the theme, which is a continuation of our discussion yesterday, and very appropriately titled Practice in Sacred Landscapes. We have three speakers and two discussants. And I think uh, 
rather than call all of them at this time to the stage and then ask them to move back to their seats when the presentations begin, we will dispense with that formality and I will ask them to come to the stage during the question and answer session. Organizers have invested a lot in me for keeping the time. I intend to be very serious about it. <laughs> if the speakers think they have more than 15 minutes, think again. <laughs> we don't want to indulge in physical violence, especially when you're talking about Buddhism and the Himalaya, but we do want to keep the time. So our first speaker is Jeremy Spoon from the Mountain Institute, deities bringing foreigners to see Mount Everest, tourism, everyday Buddhism, environmental sustainability, and the world's highest ecosystem. Jeremy. Hello, everybody. I want to say it's quite an honor to be here. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me and to share this stuff. Kumbhu Sherpa, everyday Buddhist knowledge and practice is in constant flux. The heterogeneous spiritual tradition adapts to suit everyday need. Knowledge and practice differ by individual, household, or settlement, depending on a host of factors. Sherpa place-based spiritual traditions can influence environmental ethic and resulting decisions in sustainable ways. However, their adaptation to fit contemporary circumstances may alter their utility as conservation instruments. Poli political and economic circumstances layered upon an extreme high mountain geography shape human environment relationships in this global tourist destination. The Kumbu Sherpa reside in Sagamatha National Park, established in 1976 and expanded in 2002. As of 2007, three to 4,000 Sherpa residents maintained a degree of control over the protected area. Although power was centralized with the non-Sherpa chief warden under the purview of the Na Nepal government and supported by the police and the army. The protected area and buffer zone are populated by a variety of ethnic groups. Most non-Sherpa are seasonal laborers from other indigenous peoples who migrate to the area for work during the tourist seasons or to assist in building the tourism infrastructure during the off season. Some also rent properties from Sherpa landowners for various businesses. Tourism drives life in Kumbu and much of the surrounding areas. Many Sherpa have lived their entire lives in the host guest theater. More than 30,000 tourists visit the area each year, a number that has been consistently on the rise since the first tourists entered the area in the 1960s. The Sherpa have served in various roles over the years in the industry, initially as guides and porters, and later as various roles uh, as specialized mountaineering guides, lodges, and tea shop owners. They've maintained a degree of control over the tourism industry, increasing their agency in what they now consider to be their ancestral homeland. Sherpa per capita income is almost 10 times higher than the average Nepali. However, the benefits are not shared equally. Households along the tourist route have higher economic capacity, owning the majority of lodges and tea shops along the trail to Mount Everest Base Camp and associated destinations. Households off the route practice more agro-pastoralism and serve in on-the-ground tourism positions, such as mountaineering guides. In the words of a female lodge owner, rich people work in offices and poor people go into the forest. All Sherpa households own agricultural fields, far less continue to own livestock, mostly yak and yak-cow hybrids. Most agricultural and pastoral activities are outsourced to non-Sherpa laborers, especially households along the tourist route. Generational differences result. In the words of a female Sherpa in her 20s, my parents just think about livestock, I think about how to make money. North American, European, and other visitors flock to the area when the views are clear. Most tourists are trekkers, 83%, although mountaineers are staples in the area at 17%, scaling some of the world's highest peaks at different times of year. Many products are brought into the area via airplanes, helicopters, and human porters for Sherpa and tourist consumption. <laughs> Inflation in the area is quite high compared to Kathmandu, 100% in 2006-2007, adjusting Sherpa economic capacity. Non-local products crept into Kumbu, Kumbu and are now staples for Sherpa and tourists, uh, such as packaged foods and alcohol from throughout Nepal, India, China, Thailand, and beyond. 
The standard of living has increased for some households, especially related to material goods. Increased value on material goods and their normative role in, the, in Sherpa culture has welcomed a stellar stream of cellular phones, DVD players, and cyber cafes. Sherpa youth now watch Hindi movies and listen to hip hop music. North Face, Patagonia, and Mountain Hardware are local fashion. Refrigerators and washing machines are more common. Many spend part of the year in urban Kathmandu and the rest in rural Kumbu. I sourced the following information from 22 months of ethnographic field work conducted between 2004 and 2007 and updated in 2008 and 2011. Most data originates from a stratified random sample of 100 individuals selected from electricity records in a local census. I also chose a 15% sample of Sherpa, Sherpa monks across six age groups through convenience sampling. Additionally, I draw from key consultant interviews with monks, lamas, and other knowledge holders to serve as a baseline of certain information. It is accepted that Sherpa Buddhism has been consistently changing over time and that the configuration during the research period was epistemic, specific to time and place, and in flux. The key consultants in literature served as this historical memory of these traditions for this study. These results have been discussed at length in other publications, and I will not give you a headache right now in looking at them. In this paper, I draw from these findings only as macro trends and add new research from unpublished results from the original research and subsequent updates. The Sherpa arrived in Kumbu around 500 years ago in Kham, uh, from Kham in eastern Tibet because of war, famine, or drought. The Sherpa are Tibetan Buddhists from the Nyingma sect. Gu Rinpoche, or Patma Sambhava, is the progenitor of the sect, one of the first formalized evolutions in Tibetan Buddhism after its arrival in the 9th century Tibet. Lives are lived in a cyclical existence of reincarnations with the hope of achieving a higher status in reincarnation through the accumulation of sonam, or merit, freeing an individual from the cycle. Sherpa Buddhist practice is stable and pervasive. Practice involves the pleasing of various, a variety of deities through ritual in the home and monastery that protect the Sherpa from a variety of maladies, ranging from environmental disasters to plane crashes. Worship occurs both in the home and community temples called gompa, which were not established until the late 17th century. Higher status families with greater economic capacity can express their wealth through feeding back resources into the monastic community and by hosting blessings in their home. Some elaborately host annual ceremonies, such as the Doomji celebration, where veneration of local protector deities occurs in the home, monastery, and on the slopes of the sacred mountain. Others conversely scorn it as a huge economic burden. Sherpa Buddhism generally considers the land as spiritually endowed in dual and overlapping ways. The first, Bayul, or hidden valleys, are valleys set aside by Guru Rinpoche for his followers in times of need. The power of the Bayul depends on an ideal code of conduct that prohibits the harming or killing of sentient beings from humans to animals to plants. Further, Bayul residents cannot go hungry and a general sense of peace and harmony must prevail in the social landscape. Breaking the code results in the weakening of the Bayul powers and its ability to protect its residents from the negative forces in the world. Guru Rinpoche opens some Bayul for his followers in times of need such as Kumbu, while others remain closed awaiting the appropriate time for opening. As of 2007, knowledge was heterogeneous across the population centered in older generations, some households along the tourist route, and monks with a few exceptions. It has experienced revitalization of late from various NGO products, projects, of which I was a part of, fueled by the monastic community, which included a documentary film on Bayul. One elder consultant commented that there were signs that the Bayul was no longer protecting the Sherpa people, evidence in the Glacial Lake outburst flood risk. He attributed this lack of protection to youth stopping to practice the Bayul code of conduct. Yula, or mountain protector deities, are the other primary spiritual endowments of the landscape. Buddhist clerics characterized them as demons subdued by Guru Rinpoche that reemerged as protectors for his followers, if pleased. They serve as local representatives of Guru Rinpoche, enforcing a place-based specific mandate dictated by the deity. They live atop mountains, typically central to human habitation. In Kumbu, there are various protector deities depending on location of settlement, this most central being Kumbu Yula, shortened to Kumbila. Reverence the deity includes participation in the annual Dumji ceremony, placing white flags on the house on particular days, and burning incense, especially tree juniper. In the past, multiple mountains had protector deities with various powers that lived upon them. Many of these peaks were also popular mountaineering destinations and the sources of wealth for many Sherpa trekking agency owners, mountaineering guides, lodge owners, and others. It appears that the number of deities is lessening and the powers are being centralized in select deities, a homogenization in a way. The protector deities contain various associates called core, 
that assist in watching over the believer's behaviors, both good and bad. The core of Kumbila are the Himalayan tar, yak, sheep, and, it is, and the yeti in some areas. Environmental taboos are extended to the mountain home of Kumbila and surrounding forests, as well as the welfare of his associates. As of 2007, Yulila knowledge was generally stable across the population, centralized on a few mountain peaks. New rituals were also being created and enacted to venerate Yula, providing opportunities to increase social cohesion, showcase wealth, and build merit. This research suggests that protector deities on mountains may be more integrated into the everyday spiritual tradition across the entire population compared to the Buddhist Bayul conception of landscape, which appeared to be on the decline or only known by elders, specialists, and more subsistence-based households. Ontology is the study of people's nature and relations of being. It expresses how people perceive the world came to be and how it functions. For some cultures, it connects people to place guiding environmental decisions. In an ideal sense, Sherpa Buddhism ontologically connects humans in the environment in some environmentally sustainable ways. Landscape features such as trees and water sources are considered the vessels for deities with direct connections to humans in their lives. Human interaction with these spiritual entities includes taboos on the harvest of live wood, especially in monastery forests, prohibitions on the harming or killing of animals, refraining from pollution in water sources, and restrictions on the climbing of mountains. Wildlife is considered the associates of protector deities, observing behavior, and providing good luck where they should. These ontological connections erase the division between humans and nature in an ideal sense. In the contemporary context, other ways of knowing plants, animals, water, mountains, and climate intermixed with the aforementioned place-based spiritual values. Indeed, indigenous knowledge is now an assemblage of local knowledges. Most Sherpa under 50 years attended some form of western style school and lived their entire lives within the western construct of a toured national park. Tourists share knowledge with Sherpa tourism operators, their perspectives weighed by local perceptions of their wealth. For many in this study, western science served as a dominant discourse associated with modernity, whereas place-based spirituality, especially the reverence of household spirits, was connected to a traditional or less developed way of knowing and interacting with the world. It was not uncommon for multiple generations in the same household to have different ontological connections with the environment. Elder individuals who often continued to herd livestock or farm, while younger cohorts participated more actively in the tourism industry, traveled to Kathmandu, worked abroad to send remittances, and so on. These same older age groups had more knowledge of the general spiritual character of the landscape, especially awareness of the Bayul concept and its associated code of conduct, as well as the existence of spirits in the trees and water sources. Interviews with younger individuals with varying levels of education and involvement in the tourist industry typically discussed plant and animal origins through a Western scientific lens. Local environmental education programs in schools and national park and NGO-sponsored revegetation programs focused on overstory tree species described as staving off erosion, sequestering carbon, and providing habitat for animals. Many of their responses suggested that they did not consider the entire landscape to be spiritually charged, but only select sacred places such as the mountain home of the protector deity Kumbila and associated protected forests that serve as offerings. Their connection to the landscape as a whole and plants in particular seemed to be weakening or severed. Deities take on powers that are necessary for people's survival at a particular point in time. These powers may be completely remade, inverted, or mixed with other ways of knowing and understanding the world depending on human need. In the Sherpa case, powers were reconfigured over time to support the trekking and mountaineering industry. Whereas at one time all mountains were taboo to climb because of the residence of mountain deities and spirits, only specific peaks are now off limits. In the comedic words of a male Sherpa in his 50s, when asked if he thought it was okay for Sherpas to climb all mountains, he said, yes, if you make money, it is okay. I also thought it was fitting that the new money in Nepal after the revolution had Mount Everest on it. Some consider mountaineering peaks to be spiritually endowed. The deities need to be pleased to ensure safety in a climb. It was not uncommon for individuals to include tourism success when describing spiritual practice and its intended outcomes. An example is Jomo Mililang Samba, who lives on Mount Everest and provides norbu or wealth to the Sherpa people. In the past, the goddess provided abundant grazing lands, fruitful harvests, and successful trading expeditions. Now she provides tourists that support local businesses. Some even commented that she raised herself up to be the highest mountain as a way to support the local people. Kumbila is by and large the most venerated deity, venerated in the annual Dumji ceremony. 
Uh, there was a perception that Sherpa mountaineers were maintaining and reinforcing the reverence of these deities because of climbing. However, this practice has been adjusted as the taboo has been lifted of climbing other mountains, and therefore the deities' powers are reconfigured to protect them while scaling their mountain home. Kumbila is most often associated with tourism success. Conversely, the powers of various spirits that live in trees, under rocks, and in water sources were on the decline. These spirits were most typically venerated in the household or settlement level and are connected to locally specific resources. Called Lu, these spirits have the power to provide both good and bad results to, on its owners depending on whether it is pleased. Lu can take on human characteristics such as smart or dumb, rich or poor. They are most often venerated by women and handed down through the generations. This research found that spiritual knowledge and everyday practice associated with these spirits was on the decline, especially among the younger generations. The engagement with a shaman to remedy ailments procured by Alu was almost non-existent compared to oral and ethnographic accounts of the past. Younger cohorts generally considered beliefs in Lu to be superstitious and associated with the older, less educated, less civilized generation. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here. Okay. Lu spirits were considered displeased by pollution. In the past, this pollution only included biodegradable litter and human waste. This has changed with the advent of the tourism industry and the general flow of outside goods in the area. Some Lu spirits owners have adapted, such as one Kumjung household that built a protective bar barrier for their Lu. Research conducted in 2011 on local perceptions of non-biodegradable litter and forests near water sources did not yield information that connected plastic, glass, and human waste to displeasing Lu spirits. Rather, justifications were dominated by the beautification of villages for tourist consumption and nature conservation. Human waste has its own stinky story. The Sherpa practiced household composting for centuries. Human waste was mixed with leaf litter collected from the forest and harvested annually as fertilizer for the field for the fields. They also collected urine to fertilize the fields. Gradually, flush toilets with septic tanks were considered a valued commodity to assume a more Western standard during the tourism season. Unfortunately, the septic tanks fill and are dumped into the locally glacially fed rivers. There is nowhere else for the waste to go. Success in tourism endeavors appeared to supersede the taboo on polluting communal water sources that contained lewd spirits in them. Deities indeed bring foreigners to see Mount Everest. The landscape appeared to be less spiritually endowed and potentially more a commodity to sell to tourists. Reverence was becoming more homogenized and centralized on specific mountain protector deities and less on the landscape as a whole or specific spirits that live in trees and water sources and water sources. The power of the deities were adapting to include contemporary circumstances. This configuration of worship may be more conducive to urban Sherpa communities in Kathmandu and transnational groups in New York and elsewhere because it is less place-based and more homogenized, common in Tibetan diasporic and transnational trans contexts. These changes will no doubt continue into the future. The deities' future powers can only be speculated. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, and we'll come back to you for questions later. And we go ahead with the next talk, Sentience of the Earth, Eco-Buddhist Mandalizing of Dwelling Place in Amdo by Dan Smear Yu. Uh, thank you. Gina, Drew, and Ashok Brown, and all your staff, wonderful staff. I, I really appreciate organizing this wonderful conference. And also, since it's a live feed, I think my uh, director also watching it. I want to thank uh, Peter Vanderveer. Hello. Thank you for your support. And uh, since year 2011, uh, we started the, uh, the study of religion ecology in China, successfully uh, completed contracting with a couple of publishers. And so we are moving forward. And also, I want to say hi to uh, my family, my kids and wife also watching me right now. Hello, Wendy. Hello, Devin. Hello, Merlin. I can't hear you. Could you put the mic on? Okay, yeah. And um, because uh, as an anthropologist, uh, family an uh, integral part, part of a research career. And we move around the world, travel to Tibet, write together, and getting online. Kids do their nano work, writing competition, and I do my own research. Um, <clears throat> so for about this paper. This paper uh, was rewritten based on my first version in my first book. 
I decided to take a different uh, angle, especially uh, uh, when I received uh, Gina's email, Ashoka's email about emphasi emphasis of lived religion, embodied religion, and I decided to redo it. And plus, I, I shot a documentary on all the subjects I mentioned in my paper, so uh, I decided to reinterpret what does it mean to be sustainable, and what, is, what does it exactly mean? Are we trying to sustain our development drive in China, so-called modernization? Are we trying to sustain a small community? And this is a question I pose to you. And so this paper does not intend to suggest green remedies to ease ongoing environmental crisis, such as those promoted in the new era of economic growth, quote unquote, propagated in 1987 by uh, Gro Harlan Grutland, then chair of the World Commission on Environment and Development. Obviously, we have seen more growth than sustainability resulting from such attempts that have come to labeled as, quote unquote, greenwashing, challenging the mastership, stewardship, or caretaking roles implied in green or sustainable rescue efforts, I prefer to set my ethnographic and theoretical emphasis on identifying the implications of an intersubjective relationship between place, gods, and humans. No offense if you're atheists, I know you're religious too, but there are gods to native people. <clears throat> so um, in my ethnographic study, what I mean by intersubjective, I mean inherent psychic connect connectivity between gods and humans through their relationship with the earth. So in which the earth is the total medium, the outer medium. And I would call it the ultimate interbeing linking all life forms together. And then there is a, a bonded relationship between humans, gods, and the place. And uh, I wanna, I, where's my PowerPoint? So uh, this paper is written with approach combining the studies of place, landscape, lived religion, and ecology. I draw uh, from ideas and theoretical perspectives uh, from Edward Casey and Tim Ingle, Barbara Bender, and Meredith McGuire, all these uh, brilliant scholars and minds. I really appreciate um, their insights, their, their theoretical uh, support to my work, and also, from you, I seek your critical perspectives on how I should or should, shall articulate our intimate but oftentimes unconscious relationship with the earth upon which we stand, with the air we breathe in, and with the meteorological fluxes touching our skin, going into our body through zillions of pores. And so earth is speaking to us in a non-stop fashion. And I want to invite you to feel the sense of the earth as we speak. <clears throat> so I want to share with you my uh, inspiration from Tibet. I'm a student of a Tibet, Tibetan people, Tibetan culture. I feel i increasingly drawn to it. I started my career as researching Chinese Buddhists going to Tibet. Their pilgrimage, they're looking for masters as spiritual uh, inspiration. But turn out, I feel their conversion to Buddhism oftentimes, not just the Buddhism, it's that piece of a land, that piece of a beautiful land. It's just very, I would call it earth-inspired religion, if I characterize Tibetan Buddhism. Because if you go to a monastery, you usually have a beautiful setting. <clears throat> so I decided to devote my time, energy, you know, winning grants to go there, to write. I'm sorry, I talk like missionary, so. <laughs> um, I don't mean to convert you, but don't you think it's exciting we're, we're living on this earth? <laughs> um, so I also uh, uh, facilitated U.S. Uh, faculty members traveling to Tibet, seminar, et cetera, very organized and tried to invite uh, uh, different speakers, and Professor Su Fangxiang was one of the speakers from Mainzhou University. After uh, we discuss and reading assignment, and we go to Tibet. But I found majority of U.S. Uh, faculty members 
they disarmed their rational mind once they got there. And I invited them to visit caves, gave them half day to sit in there. And regardless of religion, you can think about Jesus, you can think about anybody, but try to be in touch with the earth, especially inside of the earth especially when you have a vista point, looking down, looking at the valley, looking at not just the radiant light from the sun, also from the ambient light, how the light bounces off between mountains. So the land has color, smell, temperature, <laughs> and touches you everywhere. You get your goosebumps. <clears throat> Let me move forward. And then I also uh, practicing uh, photography and the documentary making. I made my, I made my first uh, uh, documentary called Embrace. I will show you briefly. But the point of making documentary process to me was haptic process. And for those of you not familiar with this word, it's from Greek, which means touch or being touched. And touch is just not only physical touch. Touch is also emotional touch and you feel something happening inside of you, and you want to communicate, but you don't know how, because it's a land. You feel it's voiceless, but you feel touched. So I touch the landscape with my lenses. <clears throat> and then uh, this paper is primarily based on my filmed interview with father and son. And I want to show you uh, a clip shortly. Um, here is some uh, theoretical uh, perspectives that I draw from different scholars, and I thought I must share with you where I stand in terms of theory, because I paid by theory. Um, <clears throat> so I listed these quotes. I'm not going to read them again. But it all shows that place has its own being, and place has its own subjectivity, and place is antecedent to what we do even in this, in this place. So I'm going to show my uh, short footage today. Young Thank 
这个人呢,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个人,他是一个
And then uh, <clears throat> I want to say that when I talk to cave dwellers, especially yogis, their experience of cave is that you learn, you, you learn the synchron synch synchronization of your mind with the earth. You know, when you have mood swings, you also have aesthetic swing. The images of the landscape look different. Even affects the nutrients from the earth itself. So it's a very complex study of the earth. But I, I, I wanted my next project would be the cave, uh, cave aspect of earth. So this is the village. Majority of them are in Aba. And you can loosely translate it as yogis. Or <clears throat> and then the village nestled in these not relatively tall mountains riding there. And that's why I called my film Embrace. Everything is embraced by the gods right there. And they feel the comfort. Yeah. And then, so <clears throat> another aspect of my paper is that do human choose the place or, hu or the place choose, chooses human to stay? So the relationship to me is mutual. And mutual in the sense that um, there is a pre-existing place, for, in the, for instance, the landscape of the village. And the abbot of the monastery often says, yeah, our, our village is like a lotus flower. You know, the mountains are the paddles, and in relation to Buddhism, it's mandalized, and that's it, no more. But to me, it's more than that, because Buddhism came relatively late, and there were other types of lifestyle, etc., and the people recognized this place. So place does talk to human. And then how do peoples communicate with earth gods? And there are rituals involved. And these are the actual actions, let's say, before the new year, etc. You offer prayers. You offer actual items to the gods, etc., incense, to please them. Because Gods usually don't have bodies, but they have senses. They can sense what you send to them, the incense, etc., and also the chanting. And then to conclude my paper, um, my, my presentation here, I want to use uh, uh, Yi Fu Tuan's phrase, uh, topophilia, the at affective bond between human and place. But I would like to add gods in it, because in a Tibetan context, gods play a very important role. But are humans environmentalists there? But sometimes I have a second thought. I rather feel, let's say, the village, and people don't want to do the environmental degradation, usually is out of fear, a fear of being punished. If I kill a wild animal, the gods will punish me and give me bad health. Not necessarily I'm a voluntary to be an environmentalist, but the mechanism is built as such. Maybe we can discuss that. <clears throat> So my last frame is that the question to all of you, do landscapes have subjectivities? I just projected the uh, garden which you here. This mountain has different names. And why is that? It speaks to different ethnic groups with the different names. And there must be some kind of uh, answers that worthwhile to explore. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yu, for a thoughtful and inspiring presentation. Uh, videos do count within the 15-minute time frame. Uh, I know, Sam, you don't, probably don't have a video, but the next speaker is uh, Samuel Thomas from the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment. And the title of the talk is The Sacred and the material, everyday choices in resource landscape in the Indian Himalayas. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, I have a dysphonic condition, so please bear with me. I'll take less than 15 minutes. Thank you, Ashok, Gina, and uh, the rest of the staff at uh, the new school for giving me this opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not a scientist, 
the insights I'm presenting here uh, were gathered over a, a period of five years when I was managing the A3 grants program in the Eastern Himalayas and working with a range of you know, civil society actors and researchers in the region. It's a work in progress and your feedback will be useful. So the Indian Eastern Himalaya is an area of great uh, you know, ethnic and biological diversity and uh, it's considered one of the global biodiversity hotspots. And uh, this is, uh, you know, just a few pictures that give you a sense of that diversity that exists there. I choose this picture here because, you know, this kind of a matrix characterizes a lot of the, you know, landscapes in the Eastern Himalayas. Of course, you know, you have a different land use when you go higher and, you know, slightly lower, but the mid-hills are largely like this. And what determines this matrix is often what we are talking about as, you know, everyday religion. It's about what you use, you know, what you spare. It could be a water source. It could be a sacred forest. So the elements are often determined by people's, you know, idea of what is sacred, you know, and what is material. And uh, unlike in the rest of India, traditional institutions and, you know, clan institutions, they govern a lot of the forests de facto, although the state claims them as unclassed state forests. And there are, you know, rules about what resources you can use at what time of the year, what you can hunt and what you can't hunt. And <clears throat> But uh, if you read a lot of the, you know, what the conservation folks have to say, they talk about empty forests, they talk about unsustainable uh, hunting pressures. But uh, that runs counter to what's actually happening in the Northeast. And uh, in the decade uh, between 1998 and 2008, you know, a lot of new species have been discovered. So these are not empty forests. You know, the, although they're being characterized like that. But these, uh, humans have also modified these landscapes to a large extent. The Apatani of the Aruna, of Arunachal Pradesh, they're supposed to have moved with the seeds of pine and uh, bamboo. And so they transformed many forests, you know, with the, uh, with the seeds that they carried. But they've also, uh, communities have set aside, you know, very significant areas as sacred forests and, you know, community forests. And there's uh, collective decision making and very informed decision making about, you know, what can be used uh, and whether certain areas should be allowed to recover. But not all traditional use is uh, benign. Uh, recently, uh, there was the example of the mass hunting of Amur falcons, a migratory species in Nagaland. Uh, they were estimating that close to 150,000 birds were removed, you know, when they were passing through. And that a similar subpopulation that used to winter in peninsular India may have been wiped out due to local hunting. Right? There's also the ghost tree, uh, which, was, which is now extinct in the wild because it was thought that when it flowered, it caused famine. So people cut down every single ghost tree, right? So, you know, uh, when we talk about everyday religion practice, it's not you know, always, you know, <clears throat> uh, it doesn't always have conservation outcomes sometimes, you know, these things result. But 
communities are sensitive to what's happening in their landscape and they've got information. So one project that we worked with in the Tali Valley Wildlife Sanctuary, 16 hunters set aside their guns to do a camera trapping exercise over a year. And based on that information, the Upper Tani, you know, clan heads decided that they may have to ban hunting for a certain period to allow populations to recover. <clears throat> I mean, uh, there is a conflict over who controls these forests. And although, although you know, the Northeast has a special status and you know, a lot of customary law, the government says that all forests other than the you know, private uh, forests and lands are unclassed state forests. And uh, this is a certain erasure of the you know, lived realities of those landscapes and <clears throat> But it's also, you know, it precedes capture for other purposes, for creating, creating protected areas, for, you know, diversion for dams or, you know, whatever. Once a state claims it as its own, then, you know, it's diverted for other use. The stated aim of the you know, government is also to increase the area under protected areas. Although we know, you know, how well they're managed and you know, a lot of them are just paper parks. The government has no presence, the government has no clue. And a lot of the crisis narratives uh, center on hunting and shifting agriculture, and they're always portrayed as, uh, you know, harmful. <laughs> the Forest Rights Act of 2006, you know, granted people, you know, the rights over their land and over the forests that they used. But this has also resulted in a lot of divisions and you know, debates in the Northeast, where a lot of community people say, you know, we don't want to be concessionaires. These lands are ours. You know, so you know, they reject the idea of the state you know, giving them rights, because you know, these rights are already theirs. And there are very clear rules in most communities about you know, what can and cannot be hunted, and a lot of this has to do with people's beliefs about certain animals. Okay. One, of, one of the researchers we worked with, he went to Mehau Wildlife Sanctuary to study the hula gibbon, which is India's only true ape. And he came across a problem typical to the Northeast. The Idu Mishmi people do not hunt the hula gibbon. Uh, but there were other developments in the landscape that were threatening the primate. The horticulture department was encouraging people to set up you know, orange orchards. And that was creating gaps in the canopy, which were affecting this very social and exclusively arboreal you know, primate. So although you know, a community might protect a certain animal and <clears throat> And uh, this might be significant to the survival of viable populations. Other developments, you know, could threaten it. You know, Buddhist tribes in general, the Monpa, the Sharshup, they generally don't hunt primates. And uh, the Gangetic dolphin, for example, is protected in the Kulsi River by fisher folk but it's hunted by others in the, you know, in the main course of the Brahmaputra. So, you know, viable populations exist where it's protected, but in other places, you know, it's very threatened. Yeah, that, uh, that's the hula given, and uh, that's the gan gangetic dolphin. But there are other changes as well. In Mizoram 2007, I was attending a meeting called by the Forest Department uh, to announce a new project. And uh, a senior official of the forest department was telling the gathering that Adam was the world's first forest guard because God gave him charge of Eden. Surprising coming from a government official at a government function. 
but not so surprising because Mizoram went from being predominantly animist to com almost completely Christian in 100 years. So what happens when a singular view of nature, in this instance a Judeo-Christian view, replaces a whole range of creation myths you know, uh, and uh, taboos and you know, other beliefs about animals, about nature. And these are questions that we might, we might want, you know, want to partner. There are also systems under stress, you know, because of uh, various factors. And this is a picture that is in the book. Uh, it's not very clear, I think, but uh, there's a pelt of a endangered clouded leopard hanging in a Naga kitchen. It was hunted during a mandatory no hunting period by the village head, right? So in many cases, these individual choices are undermining, you know, collective decision making about, you know, conservation. In the case of the Amur falcon that I referred to, they estimated that about two truckloads of these birds are delivered to Dimapur. So there's a certain commercialization. There is selective hunting for high value animal products, all of which you know are undermining the resource use uh, rules that have been in place for a long time. But the larger problems are with monocultures, with dams, and mining in the northeast. So while we talk about everyday religion and practice in the northeast, we need to situate it in terms of what's happening uh, across the northeast. If I spoke of all the hydropower projects that are planned for the Northeast, it'll probably make some of you very violently ill. So I'll stick to Sikkim. And uh, it's quite bad. One state, one river system, and 28 proposed projects. You know, that communities in their small ways might be conserving, might be doing a lot of things. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, these larger developments are com changing the coordinates of everything, you know. Uh, and it's, you know, uh, destroying traditional homelands, resources, and the way people used to manage them. <clears throat> so, I mean, we need to understand and situate this in, you know, in terms of the larger developments in the region. And uh, we need um, closer discussions across di disciplines and filling you know, key gaps in our understanding of you know, how these various systems, these matrices have you know, complemented uh, you know, conservation efforts. Uh, but Yesterday there was a question about what institutions can do, and you know Thomas said he's not very hopeful. Uh, but the World Bank, in its infinite you know wisdom, once said that Himalayan hydropower sites are, from a social and environmental perspective, among the most benign. I mean, we need to question statements like this. You know, you know what is the basis of a statement like that? Because that that then becomes the blueprint for India's you know hydropower policy. And, and as institutions, I think we have this role to play. We also need to, you know, <clears throat> look at the challenges that traditional institutions are facing in the Northeast and how we might, through our work, through collaborative research, you know, strengthen, uh, you know, their work and their role in uh, resource management. I think that's it. Thanks. <clears throat>